welcome uh, to our fall focus. My name is Jim Warren. I'm with TechSapa, and we are glad to have you guys here today. Uh, we got a great program this afternoon. Uh, another one of our uh, focus programs. This is focusing on performance, and we have a panel of district engineers uh, to talk about what's going on with Texta. So let's go ahead and get started uh, with some of the preliminary stuff here. Um, this is our panel today, and we'll be introducing them here in just a couple minutes. Our program this month is focusing heavily on our scholarship program. That's what our fall focus is, not on just information, but also on changing lives. And so our tech, our program is set up this month. We're taking scholar, we're taking uh, donations for our, our scholarship program. TexasAsphalt.org slash 2020 donate will bring you a page where you can actually donate to our program. Wanted to give you a big thanks to our scholarship donors who have already donated uh, to the program this month. Our benefactors are Angel Brothers and Century Asphalt. Our champion uh, scholarship level is uh, Anderson Columbia so far, uh, A.L. Helmkamp and Longview Asphalt are our patrons. Our sponsors are HNTB, Jebro Inc., Power Screen Texas, and Lawast. And our that advocate is Cutler. Here's today's lineup, and we're going to go ahead and do that real uh, as we get started. We're going to come back after the safety share, and Harold's going to do a little introduction. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and read our safety share today, which is on proper loading and handling. If you have a truck, chances are you have transported a variety of cargo. Moving furniture, tools, appliances, or towing trailers can be physically and mentally stressful and potentially dangerous. According to the AAA Foundation for Safety, there's an estimated 25,000 road accidents every year caused by detached vehicle parts or cargo or, and materials falling off trucks. So before you hit the road with your cargo and tow, follow these safety procedures for proper loading and handling. Number one, prepare your truck for cargo. To ensure your items are safely secured, invest in materials that will not only keep your cargo in place, but protect your truck and your belongings. Non-skid bed liners reduce the shifting of slippery, reduce slip. Yeah, let me try that again. Non-skid bed liners reduce shifting on slippery bed floors in breaking and cornering situations. To keep smaller items such as tools or groceries from blowing out while traveling, install a permanent toolbox or secure a large cooler in the back of your truck. Always check your 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 additional items such as ratchet straps and tarps and cargo netting to make sure they are in usable condition plan your trip. When hauling exceptionally large items or towing a trailer, it's best to travel on the smoothest and safest path. I think I know what kind of what kind of pavement we want you to travel on. Avoiding rough and winding roads to decrease the chance you will subject your cargo to extreme forces. Be sure to check the weather ahead of, ahead of time as well. And also remember to load and label your items accordingly. Very heavy loads should be loaded far forward as possible in a truck bed to prevent the front of the vehicle from becoming light, which makes steering less effective and more difficult. Unusually long loads should be marked with a flag on the end so the other drivers will notice the overhanging the tailgate and avoid approaching too closely. Long loads are also likely to shift and should be secured with a guy line to keep them stationary. No matter what you're carrying or towing, it's your responsibility as the vehicle operator to ensure your load is secure. Even from the smallest item falling out of your truck on a highway can cause a major, potentially fatal injuries to other motorists and cyclists. So plan, prepare, and load your cargo accordingly to ensure safe transport in your truck. All right, so there we go. So we are, uh, again, glad to have you here. I've got uh, TechSap as Executive Vice President Harold Mullen here uh, to say good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Hey, thank you, Jim. Appreciate Absolutely. that. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Harold Mullen with TechSap, and we are delighted that you are here with us with another edition of TechSap's Fall Focus today. This afternoon, we're focused on performance. If anybody knows about performance, it's our TechSap district. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of projects going on out there. We've accelerated projects because we've had reduction in, in traffic. They've got a lot going on. There's people working from home. There's people out there on the front lines. Uh, we have new specifications they're working under, new test procedures. We have a brand new liquid asphalt sampling and testing program that we talked about earlier today. So we have a lot going on in those districts and they are performing. And we certainly appreciate all the work that, that the districts do. 
and all the, the work that the contractors are doing within those districts is showing that there's a great partnership going on out there. And I know Quincy Allen, who's our uh, TxDOT uh, Director of District Operations, has been a great partner in quality with us for so many years. Uh, Quincy, as you well know, we started our Partners in Quality program in the Houston District, and I think you've been there since day one, and uh, especially since you were the uh, the district engineer ho holding those Partners in Quality meetings. Uh, it's been a great partnership, and we appreciate that. And I know you had agreed to do this this program, even our annual meeting, and that's where we wish we were. We're down at the annual meeting in, in beautiful San Antonio, but uh, hey, this is going to be just as good right here. I know you all have a lot of good information for us. I know you also have Buddy Williams there from the, from the Atlanta district and uh, Lance Simmons from the Bryan district and also Paul Wrights down there at Yoakum. So Quincy, I just want to say thank you so much for a great partnership, for agreeing to do this program, and we're looking forward to it. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the program. Harold, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All righty. Um, Jim, are you going to do introductions or am I? Uh, uh, I'll, let's let's go ahead and get started. If you want to go ahead and introduce them and uh, and we'll go ahead and we'll go from there. Yes, sir. All righty. Um, we'll go in in order of presentation uh, today. I'm pleased to introduce Lance Simmons. Uh, he's our district engineer in the Bryan district. Uh, do an awesome job and, and um, got a tremendous team there. Um, not only do they take care of very challenging projects, they do it in a way that keeps their team safe. Uh, additional challenges have been placed on Lance and other textile folks with uh, COVID-19. This morning, or this afternoon, I guess it is now, um, buddy, is it still morning in California? I can't remember. Anyway, all right. Um, but no, we're going to get started with the with COVID safety moment. Lance is going to take that. And let's go now, Lance. You bet, Quincy. Thank you. Uh, Harold and Jim, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk. It is a uh, pleasure to uh, participate in these things. Uh, really honored to, uh, to be on a panel with, uh, with Buddy and Paul both. Uh, really glad to see uh, y'all just went for a high quality panel and did not base it just based on looks. Uh, and in mine and Buddy's case, even mastery of the uh, English language. So, uh, so I'm glad always to uh, to share what is going good in the Bryan District. Uh, and Quincy, you are right. Uh, so COVID has uh, has just added a whole other challenge uh, to our safety program. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit what all it is doing to our safety program, and then just kind of what it is doing to our uh, all our our mission and operations in general. Uh, but it is really uh, affected our safety program in two ways. So one, it is just a lot of new things uh, that we are doing. Uh, and we challenge our folks all the time uh, to remember a lot when it comes to our safety program, whether it's uh, 360s or park brakes or lights or spotting or backing, uh, or just a lot of those things that uh, we have in our foundation program. Uh, when you throw in a whole nother set of, uh, of challenges and tasks, uh, like meeting outside and uh, and minimizing the number of folks that can ride in a vehicle, and you know, so we've got a whole lot more folks uh, working from home. Uh, we can't even shake hands anymore. A lot more meetings by conference calls and webexes. Uh, we even open doors different. We're cleaning like crazy. Travel is out. Uh, most folks don't even come into the office anymore. Uh, we had some shelters in place orders. We had some curfews. It was a lot for our folks to remember uh, on top of everything else we had tasked them with uh, on trying to get through the day safely. Uh, and not to mention, so the second biggest challenge we faced is uh, is just communication uh, has been a lot tougher. Uh, so the meeting outside uh, is pretty neat at times, but it does make it harder to hear, especially when you're having to uh, to stay a safe distance away, uh, not to mention the fact that uh, so we don't get to use always those uh, those handy TVs that we had to show Google Maps uh, and Google Earth to show where we're going. Uh, but we tried to get as uh, creative and inventive as we could uh, to still have uh, a good meeting outside to make sure everything is getting discussed. Uh, and here in the Bryan District, even we have added uh, a lot of things that used to get discussed out on the road. 
to where they now get discussed uh, in the yard even before everybody leaves. Uh, Chad Boney here has even helped uh, develop a checklist uh, that we run through just to make sure that uh, we get everything that is dis that needs to be discussed discussed with everybody there uh, to for some of that stuff that might get missed uh, when you are in smaller groups and a long way away from each other uh, and traffic going by you uh, and just wind noise and stuff you just fight uh, on a daily basis uh, just trying to make that communication easier. Uh, but I'm convinced our folks are uh, are up for any challenge, uh, and we love a challenge, and we understand we've got to do all these new things while still continuing our mission, uh, and we are certainly getting it done. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of talk about how it has uh, affected some of our, our operations now. Uh, it has certainly made uh, communication a challenge, even, uh, even just in staff meetings and uh, supervisors' mm -hmm. meetings, uh, because we're not having those in person now. Uh, and we've just tried to uh, to really streamline our communication uh, and not use eight words when three will do uh, and just try to get straight to the point on where we're at, uh, just to where uh, there is no misunderstanding out there at all on what we're trying to do with our mission. Uh, and certain things, even like temperature checking, uh, we go through every day. It is uh, added a little bit more to our plate, uh, but it is one of those things that uh, we have pretty much uh, got down to uh, all to where it is just as streamlined as can be, uh, and it has turned into one of those things I really enjoy. Uh, so Wednesday is my temperature day. I have uh, found I have now got just about everybody's vehicle memorized, uh, and I do enjoy getting to uh, have everybody roll the window down and say good morning to them uh, individually as they pull up. Uh, every now and then I'll go out there when it is not even my day uh, and stay socially distanced away from the uh, assigned temperature taker just to say good morning. Uh, and on certain things, it has uh, it has really helped uh, with all that. So we have uh, we have got a lot. We have made a lot of changes in a hurry. Uh, nobody has really ever accused TextDot uh, of being agile, uh, and I don't know of a time in our 102 year history that we've made more changes to our operations than we have in the last few months. Mm. Uh, but I have been quite pleased uh, with how our folks have uh, have adapted. Uh, and they have certainly took it in stride and still uh, managed to get our work done. And we, we still have a lot of work uh, going on out there, as Howard talked about. Uh, and it is one of those things we, uh, we have still managed to get all that done. And I'm going to share a few benefits uh, that I have found just in the last few months. Uh, so I find myself uh, traveling uh, specifically to Austin a whole lot less. Uh, I have a lot of time given back to me. Uh, and I certainly have put that to good use. I have probably spent more time in the field the last few months uh, than I have at any time I have been here, uh, and I have liked that a lot. So stopping in, looking on jobs, checking in on crews, uh, doing all that while staying safe and socially distanced from everybody uh, has been a challenge for me, uh, but it is one of those things that I have enjoyed. Uh, and even when we finish uh, and get to some sort of semblance of normalcy, uh, there are a few practices that we have learned in all this that I think we're going to uh, we're going to keep. Uh, we have uh, really enjoyed our supervisors' meetings that have all been through WebEx, uh, and we have certainly saved a lot of our supervisors from having to drive in. Uh, we have a lot more of them now, uh, and they're just a lot shorter, uh, so we can have one that gets 45 minutes and have a lot of bullet points and uh, get stuff covered uh, and be done. Uh, and I feel like that is uh, one of those things that has just gotten a lot more efficient. Uh, and we're going, to, uh, we're going to incorporate that into what we are doing in all that, too. Uh, another really good thing that we have learned is, uh, man, it has really increased uh, communication amongst all the districts. Uh, and even with the districts, with the divisions on just how to solve problems. Uh, so a lot of problems that we didn't face pre-COVID uh, that we were handled with. Uh, we just got to uh, communicate with each other a lot better. And there is a lot of really good information sharing going on right now uh, amongst all the districts and even a lot of the divisions that we didn't deal with a whole lot. Uh, and even our administration, everybody has uh, just rolled their sleeves up, solved problems. Uh, and there have been a time or two that Paul and Buddy have solved problems a little quicker uh, and a little better than the Bryan district did. Uh, I don't mind stealing their good ideas and putting them to use here when it works out good. Uh, but we talk to each other a bunch, uh, and I hope that is something that really continues uh, when we get through this thing as far as uh, 
just that good communication when it comes to problem solving. Uh, we have uh, yet here uh, got to a point to where we are uh, we are thinking about uh, bringing some more folks back to work. So the number of cases in the Bryan District right now are on the way back up. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, with A&M bringing all the students back. Uh, not to mention just uh, a lot of schools starting back up. Uh, so we hit a high this summer, uh, kind of went down through a uh, lull somewhere in the uh, month of July now, uh, and those cases are still back up. Uh, but we watch it all the time uh, to determine whether or not we're going to change our operations on the number of folks that we have uh, coming to work uh, for sure. Uh, and another thing it has uh, really affected it that, uh, that really showed in Hurricane Laura uh, is it has certainly changed the way we uh, we respond to emergency operations. Uh, so we still uh, want to uh, handle an emergency operation and still meet uh, our COVID playbook to keep everybody safe. Uh, and it did uh, add a few challenges to all that, but our employees, everybody that was involved in that, uh, managed to do that successfully. We went through that entire Hurricane Laura event uh, with a lot of crews responding, uh, a lot of folks. Uh, all in Beaumont, and to my knowledge, we did not uh, incur a single case in all that. Uh, it certainly had to uh, communicate a little better, uh, and it certainly uh, uh, required traveling and even responding uh, to all those districts quite a bit. Uh, but I was quite pleased with how successful that was, and I'm convinced uh, we're going to be even better uh, prepared for the next one. Uh, so we just keep trying to uh, to figure out a way to get better and more uh, creative and uh, all just streamline this as good as we can, uh, but the morale here in the Bryant District has uh, been really good throughout. Uh, everybody uh, is still glad to uh, be able to come to work and certainly appreciates all of the efforts uh, that our administration is doing to uh, to help keep us safe. So Quincy, uh, I'll be glad to take questions and if there's uh, anything else you want me to touch on, I will be glad to. Lance, thank you very much. Um... Let's roll through the presentations and then we'll see what pops up uh, in the question box when we get done. Okay. So yeah, there, if any, just a reminder, everybody, if you got, I got a question, go ahead and type it in and send it in. Just type it in the question box and hit the send button and uh, we'll be able to read it off to uh, Quincy and the panel. Thank you. Excellent. Jim, let's go to California. I mean, uh, excuse me, buddy. <laughs> And you're going to fit in well over there, my brother. Um, <laughs> you may want to tell him why, because people probably think he's moved to California. now. Uh, he is in California right now, already, mentally anyway, uh, but he's in process of starting a vacation, and we're thankful that he was able to peel off a few minutes for us. Uh, in fact, he's in the airport right now, uh, in the plane circling, waiting for him to get through. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, he said it out to visit some friends with his wife, and we wish him well and a well-deserved short vacation. But we're glad you're here, brother. Um, buddy's going to visit with us today about uh, recycled materials, and we'll see where that that conversation takes us. Buddy um, became the district engineer in Atlanta a couple of months ago. Before that, he did something with materials here at TxDOT, and uh, I believe it has served him well and will serve him well today. Buddy and his, his family make their home. Are you in Atlanta now, buddy? Is that? Well, we, we live in Texarkana, actually, about a mile from where we lived three years ago. Well, I'm sure everybody at your house is glad to be home or at least closer to, to home. And uh, we're thankful you're here today. Okay, all that said, let's get started. If I you need to add something to your introduction, do it now. And we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Quincy. It is, uh, it is really great to, uh, you know, have the opportunity to, uh, you know, visit with everybody and, and participate in this. Uh, you know, I, I'm like everybody else, you know, Texas app of the annual meeting is one of the most enjoyable conferences that we go to every year. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, old COVID getting out of the way and us being able to get back to that one of these days. But, uh, all that being said, uh, you did mention I spent some time in materials. You know, I spent 28 years in, in, in Atlanta, uh, a lot of it in construction, nearly all of it, as a matter of fact. And, you know, uh, two of the materials questions I always ask was, does it pass? And if it doesn't pass, will it work? Well, 
you know, you don't spend as much time as I did in materials and tests around a lot of smart people out there and, uh, and, and learn some, learn a lot from those folks. And, uh, and when it comes to recycled materials, I heard of some stuff that I'd never heard of before when we were out there. You know, people people been trying to turn our roads into linear landfills, it seems like. They want to put, uh, you know, they want to put uh, broken glass, slag, uh, you know, cr- you know, ground up tires. Uh, been a lot of stuff on YouTube about putting plastic bottles in it. We tried it one time and out there and it ran everybody out of the lab. Uh, you know, I think one time uh, I heard that uh, it's a story that Miles tells that they even tried to put pig fat in it one time and maybe caught the plant on fire. But, uh, but you know, uh, what we've found is, is that if we'll focus on the things we know, we can get some good out of it. And that's recycled asphalt pavement wrap. And, uh, and so we, uh, you know, it's what makes sense. You know, it's, uh, it's readily available. You know, we, we, we produce it you know, by nature in our, pro- in our uh, projects, a lot of times we even produce it on the projects that we're, you know, using it on, uh, or, you know, have a, a contractor will have a stockpile, the producer will have a stockpile that they're using out of and replacing with that. It's just something that works good for us in industry. Uh, you know, over the years, uh, we've kind of gone up and down on our percentages of, of wrap that we've used. I, I know, uh, I think at one time in warm mix asphalt, we used up to 30% in, in some of our uh, mixes. Uh, uh, since then, I think now we've uh, kind of uh, dialed it back in some of the super paved mixes to, uh, you know, around 15%. A lot of times it's based on what layer it goes in and, and, and just how to get, you know, how to get the best performance out of it. But right now, the one thing that I want to talk about is something that MTD has enlisted some help from, uh, University of Texas, UTEP, and TTI at AM, and and they're working on an initiative called Balance Mix Design, and uh, it's uh, really exciting. Uh, it is uh, it is an effort to you know balance those properties. Over the years, you know, we've gone from making dry mixes to making you know fat mixes that rutted too quick, and it's just like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know you. It's, it's either it's either too dry and cracking or, or, or too rich and rutting, and we just can't seem to get it just right. But uh, Balanced Mix Design Initiative is going to go a long way towards that. We're actually going to analyze the wrap. That's what some of the uh, some of the universities are doing for us, and and, and try to try to get an idea of the properties of that of that of that wrap. And, and how it's going to affect the long-term performance of that pavement. Uh, you know, one of the great things about it is uh, is that you know we, we've seen some that, that uh, some depending on the wrap get up to 35 percent and get some real good performance out of them. Uh, you know, they're they're going to going to tie some uh, working with some new tests because it's great when you design with that wrap and come up with. Uh, with the design, but, but, you know, we all know how that stuff varies a little bit. So, so they're working on some new tests. Uh, uh, everybody's familiar with the uh, Hamburg test to uh, measure the rutting in our pavements, but they're working on some, uh, uh, a, a test called the ideal rutting test that, uh, that, and, and correlating it back to the, to the Hamburg so that we can almost get real time production test out of that and maybe run it, you know, instead of, Oh, uh, like a Hamburg wants a project or wants a lot, you know, running it every sub lot, you know, and, and see where we're going with our wrap to see, see where we can get with that. Uh, I know a little bit more familiar to everybody is the ideal cracking test, ideal CT. And, uh, you know, that, that ties, we already know how good it correlates with the overlay test. And it's another test that gives us real time answers. And so, uh, we're able to, uh, you know, we're able to incorporate that, that wrap and know how it's going to affect our performance. Like I said, with those real time production tests, predict that performance and, and maximize the use of those recycled materials. I think it's, uh, it's something really exciting. I know uh, here in the Atlanta district, we have, uh, we've got a couple of projects that actually have some of our balanced mix designs on the road and we're monitoring those and uh, uh UTEP's looking at them, and, and we're seeing where we're at on them and what they're doing. Uh, we've got another one coming up on US 59, so that's going to be a real test for it. You know, that's the uh, 59 is about the closest thing you can get to an interstate that doesn't have a red and blue sign on it. So we'll see what happens there. But 
I'm really excited about how the balanced mix design initiative is gonna what it's gonna do for the use of RAP and 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 the perform long term performance of our pavement. Uh, real quick, uh, I did uh, listen this morning to Miles Ryan and a nod and uh, talk about the uh, asphalt binder monitor program and uh, you know that's something that uh, you know I, I was involved on both ends of that i've had uh, michael lee ask me uh, several times since i've been back i know you said this when you were at, at materials and tests how do you feel about that now that you're in a district and uh, <laughs> and, and and i still stick with it you know i, I think it's a good program uh it's uh it's 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 a fairly new you know fairly new new program but it's something that if we just stick with it and uh and and put our faith in and i think it's already making a difference and i think it's going to you know one of the one of the keys to it uh, i was talking to ryan here a while back and and he said that you know one of the one of the keys to it is you know uh, sampling in the field contractor takes that sample text dot or our representative witnesses it and then we got to stay on top of it from there on out. You know, we got to get that sample labeled. We got to take care of that sample, and uh, and and what you know, take care of the chain of possession. Uh, get it, get it submitted in a timely fashion. Not just the quality of the sample, but also to get those results in, so that uh, uh, materials and tests can can get their their tests run. They do a great job. They, I heard them talk about this morning about the number of samples they ran. And when you start looking at the number of tests on each sample, it, it's mind boggling. Uh, they do a great job, uh, but the, uh, you know, there's a lot of tools that they're coming out with. So we can, you know, we can look at that stuff. And, and, and if we have an issue in a district, we can look at it and we can see what that asphalt, what that, you know, the, the load that left behind it, it went somewhere else. We can see how the test came out on it. And it allows us to make some good decisions on it. And so uh, I, I think it's a good process. If we just hang with it and uh, and put some faith in it, I think it'll make a difference it already has. Any questions, y'all? Come on. Buddy, we're going to hold up till the end. Um, All right. Excellent job on your presentation. Oh, thank you. Again, um, don't have to think about us in California, but we'll be thinking about you. Yeah, right. Well, Quincy, you know, I, you, you said I was going to fit in in California. You know, I did spend two years in Austin. Austin? <laughs> Where is Austin, California? Oh, <laughs> oh my. <laughs> All right. Um, good job, brother. I appreciate you. Let's go to Paul Wrights. Um, Paul is district engineer in Yoakum. Uh, when I was a district engineer in Houston, it was a uh, obviously I had neighbors in, in the Bryan district, and that'd be Lance and 249, I-45 that way. Paul, it just seemed like you and I on I-10 out there near Sealy, um, that was a pretty good deal. It still continues to this day. The work is well underway, and it, it's a pleasure working with you and, and your team out there. I know you guys got very talented folks and uh, that works going really well uh, also when you travel down uh, south on 59 you see Paul and his team got a lot of work down there too I know you guys are really busy I appreciate you taking time for us today and today I believe you're going to visit with us about challenges and successes with asphalt take it away my brother Appreciate it, Quincy. Yeah, you kind of make me nervous when you when you mention those two jobs because they have a lot of the white stuff on it. So we might want to move away from those, but that's all right. Uh, it's an honor. It's an honor that to 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 be asked to to serve on this panel panel. Like I say, with the two other DEs, it's, it's just an honor to be able to sit with them and, and speak about it. Uh, and they're right. The Tex Apa that conference is is probably one of the best ones we go to, and uh, it is going to be missed this year. We'll have to make it up on the next one, but. Uh, I do appreciate the time and going to try to go through some challenges and successes. Uh, I think one thing, you know, good about discussing the challenges, most of the time with the partnerships we have with the TechSAPA, that uh, they turn into successes. So uh, we, we've got to talk about the challenges. But here in Yoakum, one of, one of our tough, one of our toughest ones is, is money. You know, we just, we try to get more and more money so we can put thicker and thicker layers down. That, that asphalt's done as well. 
And uh, that's pretty much, that's the largest port, part of our construction and maintenance budget is asphalt. And here we're just trying to find more money to be able to put a thicker mat to get a little more life out of that road. Uh, kind of going on to the safety part, you know, the, the, the traffic control plans, uh, you know, we, we have good setups. Uh, we start out good, but, you know, just kind of monitoring those during the day, you know, getting with our inspectors, trying to make sure they're going through and, and actually helping the contractor in, you know, to, to watch some of that uh, on the traffic control. Uh, it's just, it's a challenge with the amount of traffic we have on the roadways and what's going on, making adjustments and, and keeping that, keeping that safe and, and keeping everybody moving through our projects safely. But uh, it, it's something that's worked well for us. Like I say, we just got to keep monitoring and working on it and try to improve on it. Uh, the seal coat, you know, it's 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 one of those, there's an art to it. You know, people from the outside look at it and say, you know, you ought to be better at that. You know, why do you have these failures? Uh, it's an art to it. And, uh, you know, Tech Stop over the last couple of years lost a lot of experience, had a lot of retirees, uh, and we lost a lot of good experience. So kind of, you know, fighting that battle here, you know, is, is getting guys up to speed. And, and, you know, that's not something you learn overnight. And uh, one thing good I think TxDOT's done is that we've developed a seal coat coordinator program. Uh, you know, we've got a statewide coordinator and each district assigns a coordinator. And uh, that way we get a little consistency around the state. Uh, we kind of get some knowledge sharing. You know, if somebody's running across an issue, we can call him and have him come in and and I think that's going to help us kind of fast track some of our younger guys and get some of our younger inspectors up to speed a little quicker. Uh, and, you know, there's no sense in one district having issues with something and, and another district can learn from it. So it, I think this seal coat coordinator program is, is going to be a very good program. Uh, we've got some of the guys that are running it. They're involved in it. They're very experienced. So they, uh, they're good. And, uh, one of them we'll have to we'll have to learn how to give them a different color cap, but I think we'll be all right. We'll we'll, we'll work through that on our statewide coordinator, but that's all right. He's he's got a lot of knowledge that he can share. It's been a big benefit for us of our seal coat coordinator, and that that'll help us get some better seal coat uh, projects out there. And like I say, that public perception of the seal coat can be pretty bad. Uh, been involved in unfortunately some pretty serious failures on seal coat, so it can happen. You know, with the heat and humidity that we fight in the, on the coast. Uh, things can change and they change real fast. Afternoon showers can can really hit a job hard. So having these young inspectors kind of learn that and watch ahead and working with a contractor, it's 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 worked out pretty good. I think another thing like Buddy was talking about is that those asphalt sampling. I think that's really going to help get some consistency in our oils. Uh, you know, where we can end up getting a better product and everything work a little bit better. Uh, one thing here in Yoakum is is we concentrate real highly on prep and seal coat roads. I know there's been some discussion statewide, maybe not in agreement with what we do with it, but uh, we put a lot of effort on our our intention is trying to level up the whole roadway. Uh, that way you get you get that seal coat. He's got a consistent surface to seal on. Uh, you know you don't have to adjust your rates as you go up and down the road. You're not patches and different different dryness of the surface. So. That's our goal. We, we, we've got some challenges to get there. It takes money and takes time, but we are getting there. Uh, but that level up, that level up that we do is, is huge on the seal coat roadways. Uh, you get some life out of it, get some long life out of it. Uh, we have about a 14, about $14 million seal coat program. And most of our roadways, it, it's not very hard for us to get a seven or eight year plus out of that seal coat. And, and I think a lot of that goes to us prepping the roadways right. You know, and, and that challenge is, like I say, is, is making sure you don't have some failures that you're sealing over, uh, making sure if you're doing your coal mix that it's out there in plenty of time to get uh, dried out and get ready for a seal. Uh, just just some things that's got to be planned ahead, and, and it makes it tough on the maintenance, especially, you know, the, the things we've been going through, like Lance talked about, you know, as far as the COVID, it throws your schedule off. We had hurricanes that we had to deal with, and it, it throws that roadway prep off. So. We've got to really push hard and make sure we're getting that prepped uh, so we get a successful seal coat. That's that's the life of our roadways. Uh, you know, one, one challenge we had here was, you know, we do we did a lot of hot mix cold laid. And uh, with the new contracts that came on board, we had some new specs that came out and had some issues working through it with the quality of it. And through a partnership with us and our supplier, we ended up finding out that the spec was that actually had to be adjusted. So that was... That's one of them, like I was talking earlier, you know, that challenge ends up turning into a success. You know, like I say, with that partnership, we worked through it and it took a little while, but we uh, we did come out and, and you know, came out what we needed to fix, got it fixed. And we've got a good product on the roadway now. So that, that was that was some good stuff that came out of that challenge. 
But you know, when when uh, when Quincy asked to you know talk about challenges and successes, uh, you know what's nice is it was is easy to come up with successes. The challenges are a little more a little little more difficult, which is a good thing because we have, like I say, uh, we we've had a successful seal coat program. Our our hot mix, you know, we we get a ten to twelve life year life cycle out of our hot mix. We we've got some good successes in it, but. Like I say, the challenges, you've got to talk about them because hopefully they, they turn into, success, into a success and we learn from them. And uh, so that, that was that's a good thing. But kind of moving into the, on the asphalt concrete end of it, the ACP, you know, uh, the, uh, the skid numbers, you know, we, we've had some little difficulties with our skid numbers later. And I think the buddy talking about that balanced mix design, I think is going to help some of that. And uh, so we're, we're, like I say, that partnership again with TechSAPA, the industry and TechSTOT, uh, it, it's, it's a huge partnership to get some of this stuff resolved. Uh, you know, it's nice to know that they have a concern just as much as we do about getting these problems fixed. And, uh, you know, like I say, that, that challenge, it, it's helped up open some communication. We get to talking about it, but I think there's a fix around the corner and we're doing pretty well getting there. So that, that's, that's been a tough thing for us to kind of get through, but. Uh, there's been some things that, that have changed and talked about, and I think they're going to help a whole lot. Uh, you know, the the C and I, I know, you know, they're going to be involved. They're going to have to be involved. We just don't have the people to, to, to take over that and take care of everything. So you know, we, we've had some challenges with some communication between C and I and, and us, you know, making sure we're getting the lab results. If something's not working right, uh, we've got to make sure that communication is good. And like Lance said earlier, it's just a little tougher now because you know, you're not you're not seeing these people all the time. The communication is a little tougher to do. You got to be have a little more incentive to get it done. And uh, so we're working through that, get some of that C and I testing, that communication, get a little bit better, and making sure we're getting results in a timely manner, uh, making sure we know you know who's supposed to get the results. Uh, you know, and that that's something like I say, kind of going into prepaid meetings. Uh, I think those are very very important. Uh, I know I'm fortunate enough to be able to sit on that TechSAPA, that Quality Initiative Committee, and that prepaid meeting is talked about a lot. And I think it's a very, very big piece of a uh, successful paving job. And that that prepaid meeting is where you discuss your communication. You, know, you figure out who's gonna be talking to who, where the stuff is, where the information is gonna go. If you have you know, failing test results, who you notify, uh, that's a big part of that prepaid meeting. That opens that line of communication up. You've got to have that line of communication open. It's very important. Uh, so those prepaid meetings are, uh, like I say, they're very important in making sure you have the right people in it. And I know it's tough. If, you know, there's some challenges on that, trying to get the right people there because everybody is busy. But uh, I know during that tech sample with those uh, committee meetings, we talk about you, you've got to make that initiative and, and attend those meetings, make sure we've got the right people there. And, and tech stops doing the same thing. You know, we've got a, our chief inspector, you know, he's probably on four or five other jobs, but he needs to be involved in that communication. So that, that's that's helped us a lot to really put some importance on those prepaid meetings, make sure we're discussing the right things. Uh, it'll help your longitudinal joints. You kind of know where you're going to start paving, how you're going to pave, and what your widths are going to be. Uh, you know, any kind of testing issues, where that information needs to go. But the overall quality of your product is going to improve when you put some importance on that, and you'll have a successful project project from that. Uh, one thing we've been working really hard with is our designers, you know, is making sure they give us the right tools and construction to make it right. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, we try to any kind of uh, asphalt concrete pavement job, we try to have some, some level up in there, some quantity of level up in there. You know, look at the roadway, see what it needs, uh, trying to teach the designers to make sure they're including some of those tools in there. Uh, whether it be a pavement repair item, because you don't want to be overlaying over something when you've got some issues underneath it. Uh, and then, like I say, you, you've got to have some level up in it. Let's end up with some good rides, a final product that does really well. So, uh, you know, we've been really pushing our design. Like I said, we've got a lot of young designers in, on, in house too that, you know, they've got to learn through this program to know, like I say, you've got to supply the tools to be able to do a good job. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell a contractor to go out there and make this road right and get some good, you know, 50 and 60 ride numbers when. You know, they're over, starting out at over 100 and we give them no level up. So, you know, we've got to make sure we're giving them the right tools and the toolbox to do it right. And that's something we're pushing on our designers to make sure we get that included in there up front. Uh, that's that's another thing I think that adds and gets to that 10 to 12 year life cycle out of your, out of your pavements. Um, PFC has been a big tool uh, success for us. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of good luck with the PFC. 
Uh, I know about, I don't know, about three or four years ago, we made a decision to put PFC on all our major routes, which our major routes, like Quincy talked earlier, the I-10 and 59. Uh, we're not going to do any overlays without PFC on it. Uh, trying to push for that road to zero. You know, I know it was talked about earlier, we're trying to get that road to zero. I think that's a huge safety improvement on those roadways. But for a district, you know, in a rural district with the amount of funds that we have, you know, we had to make that commitment because it's there's a lot of dollars involved in it. So we pulled some smaller projects and we made that commitment up front. Now we've got it budgeted in, so it, it works pretty well for us. But uh, the safety improvement over using that PFC is, is huge. Uh, the perception to the public, you know, we get a lot of good compliments on it when we do get to put that PFC out. And uh, our I-10 and US-59 is probably some of our higher accident rate roadways. So trying to trying to reduce those numbers uh, is, is a big issue. And I think the PFC would be a good way to do it. But we, we've made that commitment. And like I say, for us, it's a big dollar commitment, but it's it's been successful. And uh, we, we, we've had no problems getting 10 to 12 years out of life cycle of that. So it's been, it's been working well. Uh, you know, the only issue you have is some of that white stuff, those cracks will start interpolating, flowing back up to the top. And then we got to deal, asphalt's got to deal with it. That's all right, we'll, we'll get there. And it's, it's working well for us. Uh, another thing that I think has been successful for us is a material transfer device. Uh, I know, won't mention any names, but there's a few contracts work around here. Didn't really like them too much. So, you know, we, we were using the coke cow for years and years. And uh, we had some problems getting some mix. Uh, so we had some segregation issues, had some rides issues. You know, we're just kind of working through them, but started using the material transfer device. And it really, really improved the overall product. Uh, it, it, it's made a huge difference. Uh, it's reduced our segregation a whole lot. It's helped the ride quality. We just get a whole lot more consistent mat behind the laydown machine. So that material transfer device has been a big piece uh, of our puzzle. I think we've been missing for the last few years uh, to really get us up to that next level. You know, Yolkin District's fortunate enough, our, our, ride, our ride numbers are pretty good in the district. I mean, we, uh, like I said, the scores are high, but which makes it tough on a contractor because the expectations are a little higher. We want to make sure we're going to keep those scores and, and, and improve on them. And that material transfer device has, has been a big piece of the puzzle. It has really helped a lot. And, and like I said, I'd say if, one of our top successes we've had over probably the last year or two has been that MTD. Uh, it has really made some differences and really helped out the overall product that we're getting. So uh, if anybody wants to talk about it or ask about it, that's something I would highly recommend. Um, you know, talk with contractors. I know it's a big piece of equipment, but it's really been a good success for us. Uh, so I, I don't know. Like I say, we've, we've had, you know, there's been some challenges, but what I like about the challenges is most of them have all turned into successes. So. Uh, like I said, I just appreciate Tom getting to visit with y'all. But Quincy, that's all I've got unless somebody's got some questions. Paul, we're going to hold the questions till the end. I want to thank you, though. A very comprehensive presentation. Covered a lot of ground there. Good job. All righty. Uh, I'm last on the presentation list, and we're running a little short on time, but I, I'll, let me hit some high points, and then we'll go to questions. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about funding, and I guess funding starts with the UTP. Um, hopefully all of you know, that's the Unified Transportation Program, okay? Now that's Textot's 10-year plan that guides the development of transportation projects across the state. It determines how we're gonna, how much transportation funding the state expects to have over the next decade and how we'll distribute it. Includes all transportation projects that Textot's developing for construction over the next 10 years organized into 12 categories, and they include everything. Cat one, obviously, is preventive maintenance. Uh, Cat two, metropolitan and urban corridor funding. Cat four is connectivity. Cat 12 is uh, mission strategic. And there's other ones, obviously. Um, it's required by state law and approved by the Texas Transportation Commission each year on August 31st. First question on your quiz today is what day is was ours approved in August? That would be, you're right, Paul, the 27th. And how much, buddy? Almost $75 billion. Lance, how much is that per year? That would be $7.5 billion. There you're going, you're rolling. Okay. <laughs> Stay with me, my brothers. UTP is an important planning document for TxDOT and its planning partners at the regional and local levels. I don't know how many of y'all work in areas where MPOs are, but 
that's a whole new thing. Uh, I mean, if you haven't been there when it comes to planning and, and working the money and air quality and those sorts of things that come into play. I mean, here's some conceptual points I'd like you to carry away with you. Uh, the UTP is, it's not a budget. It's not a guarantee. Okay. Um, the textile is going to, uh, you know, fund this stuff as, as planned in 10 years. Every year we update that. And, and by law, we are allowed to update it more if we need to. Uh, the funding in that document will, among other things, improve metro and urban corridors, statewide connectivity, uh, and build projects that will help shore up energy sector. A lot of energy sector work right now in, in Odessa, for example. And our chairman likes to call that work, you know, the Permian Promise is, you know, we are able to increase the United States, uh, you know, petroleum reserves with all the work that's going on out there. So we're kind of excited about that. Before I wrap up, I'd like to talk a little bit on the micro level or a smaller level. Let's just talk about uh, what goes on in a year. Right now, uh, we've been spending a lot of time looking at the lettings each month, all right? Number one is our goal or target is $6 billion. Now, Buddy's sitting there thinking, Quincy, you just told us seven and a half billion. All right, we're talking about design, bid, bill. You know, most of our, I uh, shouldn't crack design, bill, but anyway, most of us like design, bid, bill. Um, Accept plans, look at it, put an estimate together, bid it. If you're low, you get to build it. That's how that goes. All right. The other billion and a half that's laying out there is our alternate delivery. Those are our design build project. Now, in the last couple of months, or maybe almost year, I guess, we've been really working to level the lettings. Okay. What do I mean when I say level the lettings? Trying to develop a cadence of the lettings where the project or the volume of the letting is about 500 million a year, all right? So 500 million times 12, Lance, that would be, there you go, almost 6 billion, right? Anyway, some of you remember a couple of years ago when we get into July and August with these gigantic billion dollar lettings, all right? Sounds exciting, but it really strains the system. And, We've been working to, to level that out. So there's a certain ex expectancy there. I think it would help with, you know, uh, mobilizing, getting your crew sizes and secure materials and all those things if you sort of knew what to expect. Not only the dollar volume I know is important, but also you're probably going to want to know what type of projects those are. You know, are they on the freeway or the asphalt or they something else, Paul? How do you call that? But anyway, um, we're spending a lot of time with that. So if you see or hear things about level lettings, that, that's what we're trying to do is to develop a cadence of, of lettings where the amounts are similar. And especially at the end of the summer, we don't necessarily like straining the system with the billion dollar letting, even though it sounds like fun, doesn't it? Billion dollar letting. Okay, enough of that. All right, I'll wrap up um, my presentation and that'll leave us a little bit less than 10 minutes for questions. So, Jim, Harold, let's hand that back to you and the program back to you. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, let's see. Again, we're taking questions. Go ahead and type them in, send them in. Uh, we'll take them as you go. I had a question for, uh, for Lance. Um, what, uh, you know, of all the safety stuff and all the COVID things that were going on, um, what surprised you that worked much better than you thought it would have worked? when you had to go to this, all these changes? Was there one thing in there that's like, hey, you know, that actually worked and we'll continue this on? Uh, you bet, Jim. So, so Jim, when this thing first started, I was really concerned when the governor basically required any state employee that could work from home to work from home. I thought we were going to have, oh, some potential morale issues with the folks that had to stay and work, mm. right? So, okay. so office folks uh, got sent home. Office, I mean, uh, field work folks had to stay. I really thought we were going to have a uh, "Hey, why them, not us?" type mentality. 
uh, but I was really surprised on how well our field folks responded. Uh, had a lot of interaction with them. Didn't hear any of that, uh, and was really surprised that most of our folks were really glad just to be to keep working, uh, to still have a job, uh, and to still be able to come to work every day. And I actually had a few uh, share with me kind of over to the side that it would drive them crazy to stay at home with their wife and kids. Please uh, don't make them go home. Please let them stay at work. Uh, and that was a uh, quite pleasant conversation with those folks. And our folks have uh, really, really surprised me on how uh, good the morale has been through every bit of this. So it's been a real success. Our folks are uh, always up for a challenge, Jim. That's awesome. That's awesome. Got a couple of questions that came in now. Okay. What is the one thing a contractor can do to be more successful in your districts? A wide question to anybody. Hmm. Well, I mean, as, as far as successful, uh, getting, you know, be, be the low bid on the job, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of ours, I think success is on the communication part. And, and I think, you, you know, communication, uh, every once in a while, I'll run across some deals and we have an issue arise and it's just kind of really lacking the communication. And I think communicating with that inspector and if it doesn't work there, let's let's escalate it and go. There's nothing wrong with escalating issues. But I think that communication could really make a, a lot better job uh, and things work a little bit better. Very good. Very good. OK, I got another one. All right. Um, where can we find projected seal coat and hot mix quantities per district per year? Is there some place people can go to get that information? Anybody know? We submit it every year. Okay. Uh, so we we used to. I know we used to put something together for hot mix and break it out with a, as best estimate as we could for uh, in, in materials and tests for uh, for you know aggregate and and all that stuff. Uh, not sure where that resides right now. AGC, uh, I'm sorry. Our our uh, uh, AGC always requests every year from us what, what our projections are. We give them our numbers to our AGC. Lee Taylor has always asked for ours. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, another question. How are the materials contracts going? Uh, RMCs? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I get it. MMC. Yeah. Well, they're MMC. They're new contracts. They, they've been it's for us. System. They've been working pretty well. Okay. We, we've got them figured out. Uh, it's a lot more work on our in-house people. You know, our contract personnel and maintenance. Uh, there's just a lot more work because we have a lot more contracts. Uh, we worked through some bugs initially, but right as of right now, we, they've been they've been working pretty well for us. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna uh, come. I'll, I'll, go ahead. No, I'll I'll agree with Paul. A uh, lot more paperwork on our end. Uh, but it does seem to uh, be delivering the products that we want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one came in here. Uh, with all the updates to the specifications in the last year, how has that impacted the districts, if any? All the new asphalt changes. Yeah, I don't need to answer that because I was on the other end of that <laughs> over the last two years. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, it has been a lot of information and it has been a, uh, a lot of changes. It, uh, it really takes somebody uh, a whole lot smarter than a district engineer to keep up with all of them. Uh, but it certainly seems uh, to give us, give us the results and the product that we want. And it certainly seems to have uh, solved a lot of problems. So we uh, appreciate all that. And it's one of those things to where uh, our pavement engineers are, uh, are really on the ball getting all that done. I really think they're going to work out really well. Okay, very good. All right, next question. Who is the statewide seal coat coordinator, and is it a full-time job for them? Well, uh, I, I guess I can jump out there and answer that. The uh, the state, state seal coat coordinator is a guy that I've known for a lot of years, and he's got a lot of knowledge under that LSU cap, and it is uh, Dennis Berryhill. Yeah. And it is uh, a really, really, really extra full-time job uh, during seal coat season. He puts a ton of miles. Uh, we do let him park a vehicle in Atlanta, but it doesn't stay there very much. Uh, 
But I will tell you that I think he looks forward to uh, using that comp time to shoot some pigs and do a little hunting in the wintertime. <laughs> and he did not submit that question. I just want to let you know. All right. Good deal. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. He just commented. Yes, it is a full-time job. Go Tigers. There we go. Okay. Uh, good. Hey, Jim, if, yeah. I, if I could just take two seconds. You yeah. know, Paul mentioned that uh, – Paul mentioned that hot mix quality meeting that we have and that I was bit of a, I've been a part of yes, in the seal coat. And, and I just wanted to mention, y'all talked about a lot of folks putting a lot into that. I don't know that anybody put any more into all that, all that than Dr. John Epps. Uh, he, uh, he has worked tirelessly to, uh, promote hot mix and seal coat. And, and I don't know that we could have made the progress that we've made without Dr. Epps helping out. Very good. Absolutely. John is an asset, a tremendous asset to Texas and the whole country, absolutely. Um, on the material transfer device, do you make it a requirement for all projects or is it just highly encouraged? It, we don't. We haven't made it a requirement. It's just, like I said, a contractor that started using them, seen the, the results and just have been using them. We've been fortunate enough to where we hadn't, we hadn't made a requirement on it. We, we do require them in the Atlanta district. Okay. Or, we, or that or some some sort of material transfer other than just, you know, dumping in the dumping in. It. Gotcha. And and I I've been around I've been around for land hot mix for probably thirty two well, since about nineteen eighty five and I still don't know what a coal cow is <laughs> coming from this part of the country. <laughs> Chuck Chuck will tell you. He'll give you a call here in a couple minutes. Um some guy named Michael Lee wrote in something about Lone Star University. I'm not sure what that means, but I think you guys can <laughs> figure that out. So uh, uh, thank you, Michael. Hey, that's all the questions we've got. Uh, great panel today. Um, uh, anybody want to kind of close out? Quincy, any final comments? Anybody want to go around? Just any final comments from anybody? Um, yeah, I, I'd just like to, to maybe – Pull us all together and uh, and thank you guys for having us. Number one and Harold, I appreciate the very kind remarks about partners and quality down in the Houston district. Uh, and those are very productive meetings. Some of the most uh, energetic, interactive things that, that we've done, and and uh, that was well done. I appreciate Xappa's effort in that. The other thing I want to thank uh, Jim and and Harold for helping make this thing go smoothly. But I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Emily Adams for all the work she did getting this thing coordinated because we're not the most coordinated group to work with, and, and I'll own that. Uh, but her patience and diligence uh, helped get us all together and make this a success, and, and I'm thankful for her efforts. So Very good. You guys got any final remarks? Fire them up. Let's go with you, dude. Well, I do want, just want to say thanks. I appreciate uh, Harold and Jim and uh, even you, Quincy, putting all this together. Uh, and I do want to point out, too, that uh, Buddy Williams was the only one that successfully somehow twice worked in pigs to his uh, presentation on all that. So good job, buddy. And a cow, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Awesome. Buddy, Paul, anything? No, I'm good. I'm good. I am. Uh, our flight got delayed and I am just about to get ready to run. So All I right. do appreciate y'all for having us. Have a safe trip. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. All right. Very good. Let's uh, let's wrap this up. Hey, thanks again. Uh, I got a couple uh, couple more things just to just to close out here again. Big thanks to our scholarship program uh, donors, Angel Brothers, Century Asphalt, Anderson, Columbia, A.L. Heldenkamp. Uh, Longview Asphalt, HNTB, Jebro, uh, Inc., uh, Power Screen Texas, Lawast, and Cutler. Big thanks to our panel today. Uh, you guys did an awesome job. Um, wanted to end with this with our from our tech stop partners. Uh, everybody, uh, keep trying to end the streak here. Uh, we've got work to do. Numbers are up this year, and they shouldn't be. Um, but uh, we need to do everything we can do to get them back down. So. Uh, Big thanks to everybody uh, for tuning in today. Thanks to TechStot, uh, all the people who participated today. Uh, thank you for your, your help. Thank you for your wisdom and guidance. And most importantly, thank you for your partnership. Uh, without, uh, you know, it, it's, I was telling the guys this morning, you know, we may not always agree, but we can agree to sit down and talk to each other. And that's how we make things work.
So uh, big thanks from TechSapa. Uh, on behalf of Harold, myself, and the whole team here, uh, we're pleased to be part of this program. Um, I won't use Monica, uh, Harold's moniker, but I'll use mine. Ever forward, everybody, be safe out there.